Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining us here today as we uh, share a sermon message with you. My wife and I are recording this sermon uh, in our living room. Uh, today's message is entitled, We Are Priests in the Order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek met Abraham in Genesis after an important battle to rescue his nephew Lot. And Abraham gave him 10%, that is, he gave that to Melchizedek, of all his spoils of victory in that particular battle. He was a high priest for Abraham, the father of the faithful. And in the new covenant today, he is our high priest. And we are all his priests to do priestly duties. Now the account that I just referred to can be found in Genesis, the 14th chapter. But we're going to go uh, on into Hebrews, the, chapter, the book of Hebrews, which also gives an accounting of that particular event. Let's do that then. Let's turn to Hebrews. Uh, we'll be starting in chapter 2. So Melchizedek became the high priest of the new covenant because he shed his own blood to forgive the sins of all humanity and not the blood of goats, calves, bulls, and heifers. Hebrews, the second chapter, beginning in verse 14. It's amazing how much is uh, written about Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. And it's probably amazing, too, that you've not heard much of it ever preached because it might seem like it's more technical, but actually it's more spiritual. And we want to look at what the writers of Hebrews were inspired to write. Hebrews 2, verse 14, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, referring to Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, and that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And that's, you know, the old saying is the two things you can count on happening are taxes and death. Is certainly a major topic to consider, and we don't tend to consider it until much later in life. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. So remember, he connected with Abraham in Genesis 14, and so that is referenced here. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And aren't we thankful for that? And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Amen. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who were being tempted. That's all of us. We're all tempted to do the wrong thing. And so thankfully our high priest understands the temptation. Now let's go over to chapter 4, also in verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now that's an open invitation. See, Jesus identifies with us so much that he wants us to contact him whenever we're needing mercy and to, we need to find the grace we've been given uh, to help us in our time of need. So when we have that need, let's go to him first and ask him what he can do to help us and what we need to do. You know, there are things that we need to do as well in dealing with situations, but he also gives us his wisdom, his intervention on our behalf. That's what grace and mercy are, an intervention in the spirit of our situation. Now let's go over to Hebrews, the seventh chapter. Hebrews 7 and verse 1. Now we're going to be talking directly about 
our high priest Jesus in the, the name of Melchizedek, who is the name he used with Abraham, and is the name he uses now in Hebrews, after he ascended to the right hand of the Father, after 40 days with the disciples, and 10 days before Pentecost. Since he has now been received by the Father, he is our, officially he's our high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. So, Hebrews 7 verse 1, This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He made Abraham return, returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, in other words, he has eternal life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever, as the Psalms bring out. He's the Son of God, and He remains a priest forever. Verse 4, Just think of how great He was. Even the matriarch Abraham gave Him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi, they were the, of the Levitical priesthood, who became priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites. So it's kind of like a spiritual tax. As far as they were concerned, you know, it wasn't totally that way, but somewhat. They were doing it also for spiritual reasons. Even though they also descended from Abraham, see, even though they were descendants of Abraham, they still had to pay the Levitical priest the tithe. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises, and without doubt the lesser is blessed by the greater. So the greater, of course, is Melchizedek, and the lesser would be Abraham. In one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I misstated. In other words, Abraham was the greater and Levi was the lesser, to make that clear. Because when Melchizedek met, met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Verse 11, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in, in the order of Melchizedek? Well, that's a good question, and that question is going to be answered. Not in the order of Aaron. See, why, why did that switch need to be made? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. So there was the Old Covenant Law, and there's the New Covenant Law, which is God's love. The Old Covenant Law referred mainly to the Ten Commandments that God gave on Mount Sinai. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe. And that, in other words, he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. And no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. So after the resurrection, his life was indestructible. You see, he was going to live forever and ever. He was going to continue living in eternity after his living as a human being for 33 years. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, as it says in Psalms 110 verse 4. 
the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. The former regulation limited the priesthood to Levi and his descendants. For the law made nothing perfect. See, they were still with sin. After everything was done, all the sacrifices were made, they still had sin accumulating after the sacrifice. They were never without sin, totally. It might have been for a split second when the sacrifice was made, but then the next second they were sinning again. It's our nature to do so. And a better hope was introduced by which we draw near to God, and that's the new hope that we have in the new covenant in Jesus Christ. And it was not without an oath. So we need to understand what that oath was for the new covenant and Melchizedek. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Now you see, with the Levi priesthood, they would live and then die. And they would have to be replaced by another priest. Talking about high priest in particular. But with Jesus, he would never die. And so he's in the order of Melchizedek is alive forever. Therefore, he is a priest for us in the new covenant, which lasts forever. See, the reward that we receive through his death and resurrection, which is the forgiveness of sin, and becoming the children of our Father when He reconciled us, when He was ra raised from the dead. You see, now we're in this relationship with God, with our Father, we're His children, with Jesus, He's our Savior and our Lord, and with Him being our High Priest, we are the ones that He cares for and provides for in everything that we have need. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And you see how I... It's, a uh, covenant that has better promises. He's always going to be there for us. He died for us. He identifies with us completely and totally. He understands who we are and why we do what we do. <laughs> you can't ask for a better high priest than that. And someone who has mercy and compassion on us on top of that. Such a high priest truly meets our need. <laughs> truly, that is right. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day and day, day after day. First for his own sins, which they had to do then, and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weaknesses, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. We'll continue now on in chapter 8. I imagine you didn't realize there was so much talked about concerning Melchizedek in Hebrews, did you? Well, it, it could be a little boring if we want it to be. But I prefer to think of this as being exciting news. Wow, this is great. I didn't realize we had such a good deal. <laughs> such a, a promise that's been fulfilled for us. We've been, we've been having all this advantage to being one who believes in Jesus to kind of fritter away, slip away from us. We need to embrace this. This is God's holy word. This is for us. We're the benefactors of this. So let's see what it continues to tell us in chapter 8 of Hebrews. Now the main point of what we are saying is this, we do not have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves as the sanctuary, in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere 
human being. This one is, wasn't established by Aaron or Moses. This was established by God himself. Jesus, whom our Father sent to us to save us and not to condemn us. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. You remember that this is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But there were things wrong with it, and a better covenant was then brought into play. But God found fault with the people, who we were the problem, and said, Okay, I'm going to be reading from Jeremiah 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds, see, through the Holy Spirit, and write them on their hearts, also through the Holy Spirit's indwelling, and will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. And with the advances in technology from it going around the world through, you know, you have these cameras in the sky that, you know, just continually are sending messages out all over the world. Uh, and we have all these tablets and phones and every other device that we can have to, you know, look up different apps that have important things on them, such as sermon messages about Jesus Christ. In verse 12, though I will forgive their wickedness and will remember that they, their sins no more. That is the promise of the gospel, and that's what our reality is in Jesus Christ. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Well, you know, like with all things old and new, things go out of season and out in season, out of season, in season. It's the way it is with fashion styles. And it's true with how people look at the Bible, different things they get from it at different times and different seasons. So that's the way it is. So it's hard for us to totally just understand the old and new covenant. Understand the Aaronic uh, priesthood and then Melchizedek priesthood. That's why we have to go over it from time to time so we can get everything straightened out in our thinking. But we see that as far as Jeremiah was concerned in chapter 31, boy, this new covenant that was promised was really the new deal that we wanted to have because the old one didn't work well and we were the problem. So see, Jesus corrected the problem because he forgave us our sins forever. And we now have his grace instead. And he says, come follow me. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to do that. Wow, we are truly a blessed people. So now we want to go to chapter 9 and verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary called the tabernacle. A tabernacle was set up in its first room 
were the lampstand and the table with the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. And behind the second curtain was a room called the most high holy place, which had been had had the golden altar of incense and the golden covered ark of the covenant. And this ark contained the gold jar of manna and Aaron's staff that had budded and the stone tablets of the covenant. And above the ark were the cherubim of the glory overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. We got all kinds of chapters in the Old Testament that talk about every nuance and every detail of that. So when everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry, but only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year on a atonement. And never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins, the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. And that stopped functioning when Jesus said the Holy Spirit is no longer in this place after he turned over the money changers the second time in the courtyard of the temple. That was just before him being crucified and risen from the dead. This is an illustration for the present time and indicating the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. If you can't have your conscience cleared, your knowing that your sins have been forgiven are not that enjoyable because you're worried about your conscience being afflicted still by what you did or didn't do. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. So that's always nice, but that doesn't take care of our conscience, does it? External regulations applying until the time of the new order. So we are now in the time of the new order, and we can certainly be thankful for that. Verse 11, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not part of this creation. In other words, it came from heaven. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but entered the most high holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls in the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean as well. How much more for the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. So in the first order, they could become outwardly clean but not inwardly clean because the second the sacrifice was over, a new sin entered into the picture. So, what God has done in Jesus is He's cleansed our consciences from acts that lead to death. Praise God, hallelujah. We are so blessed, so that we may serve the living God even better. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is in force only when someone, somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. That's an obvious fact when you think about it. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. Even Abraham had these things uh, verified through blood. And, uh, and Moses, you know, with the Ten Commandments. And then the Levitical priesthood after that. 
So when Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. And he said, This is the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and the everything used in its ceremonial in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands, there was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place, every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. Wouldn't that be true? But he had appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time at his second coming in glory not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Like we're all waiting for him now. Come, Jesus, come. But in the meantime, we have a living high priest, Jesus Christ, who is after the order and in the order of Melchizedek, who's there for us. We need to avail ourselves of our high priest. He's there. He's qualified. He is able to do this all the rest of eternity. And he never gets tired of hearing from us. And we must avail his generosity. Chapter 10. There are two verses here. Verse 10. Please read that with me. And by that will, we see the will that we talked about earlier, we will have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So that sacrifice, the forgiveness of our blood, made us holy in his sight, in the sight of our Father. And then in verse 14 again, For by one sacrifice he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jesus attributed his righteousness to us. Therefore we are the holy children of our Father, perfect in every way. Now we may not feel like it because we are perfect. We know that. See, we're, we got a covering, <laughs> a blessing. <laughs> it covers us. And all that our Father sees in us is Jesus. <laughs> well, I'm sure glad he sees Jesus in me, aren't you? However, we must grow in his grace and knowledge. We can't just stop because we, oh, I hit nirvana, you know, and I'm perfect, I don't have to do anything. No, that is a motivation to do more of what Jesus wants us to do. Let's notice that over in 1 Peter. You know, Jesus uh, made Peter the uh, leader of the disciples as they went forward from uh, being with him for 40 days after the resurrection and going into Pentecost and then going to all the places in the world that they were going to be going, uh, preaching the gospel, giving testimony of Jesus and giving witness to him. And so he, he shares this with us in 1 Peter 2 and verse 4. As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. That's you and me today. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's all of us who believe in Jesus. We're all a part of this holy priesthood. And what we're doing today 
is offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Are we doing that? Well, if we're not, whether our spiritual leader says we should or shouldn't, doesn't make any difference because Jesus, who's our spiritual leader, says, yes, that's what we ought to do. <clears throat> it continues on. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone that builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble <clears throat> and a rock that makes them fall. <clears throat> they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. <clears throat> Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are not only your children, but that Jesus Christ is our living high priest <clears throat> in the order of Melchizedek. And we are the holy priesthood who is working with him to do priestly works of service in the body of Christ. And we ask and pray you'll help us to do that with all faith <clears throat> and belief. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. And all together we say, Amen. <clears throat>